You don't have to work very long in this industry before you encounter a system you wish you could rewrite, or, or at the very least, overhaul significantly. It's not usually a bad system when that happens. The bad ones don't survive long enough to reach that point. More often than not, it's a system that solved a real problem. And so the problem grows and the need grows and the solution space grows. And eventually it all starts to outgrow implementation number one. And when that happens, you've got some hard questions to answer. You've got some hard decisions to make. Now, I hope our industry is getting wise enough to realize that Big Bang rewrites usually fail. But if you don't do the Big Bang rewrite, then how do you evolve piece by piece? Mm, there is no definitive answer to that. But there's a heck of a lot to be learnt from the people who are in the process of answering it, um, especially if they're doing so successfully. So today on Streaming Audio, we're joined by Jean-Francois Garay, who's a technical architect at a company called Symphony. And he's going to be telling us about his approach to the growing pains of a successful but straining monolith, his thoughts on systems architecture, and how you communicate those thoughts on architecture to the rest of the company. Because sometimes that's the hardest part. How do you get people to come along for the ride when you've got good ideas? That can make or break a project. Before we get into the details, Streaming Audio is brought to you by Confluent Developer, which is our education site for event systems and Apache Kafka. It's, it's a treasure trove of blog entries, code samples, hands-on courses, and more. So check it out at developer.confluent.io. And if you end up taking one of those hands-on courses, you're going to need a Kafka cluster. The easiest way to spin up one of those is with confluent.cloud. You can be up and running in minutes, and if you add the promo code PODCAST100 to your account, you'll get $100 of extra free credit. So with that said, let's take a peek into the realities of being a systems architect, one with solid ideas and genuine problems. My guest today is Jean-Francois Garay. Welcome to the show. Hello. Pleasure to be here with you. Good to have you. Um, so I must admit, I've woken up feeling reflective today. So before we get into the meat of the podcast, how did you get into programming? So actually, I started programming as I started my career. During my education, uh, during college, what I did was mostly focused on networking and uh, I would say computer security. And well, through that, I was introduced into programming, but more to build tools around what we were uh, studying and uh, to do some, uh, I would say, modelization uh, of, I don't know, protocols and things like that. And uh, in the end, I got into programming uh, during my master thesis. In France, we have a, a, a degree where if we go to the master, we do a six month internship into a company where we build the master thesis. Okay. And that's where I did more programming, uh, doing some stuff inside the Linux kernel and and things like that. Oh, and, <laughs> Yeah. That's well, it was simple things. Right. It was just, I mean, you just start getting knowledge into well, how you build it, uh, how you modify just very tiny things here and there. And, and, and then I started my first job, uh, which was for a company that was doing software development at that point in time. I started working in 2009, so it was just after the 2008 uh, crisis. So the job market was not very great at that point in time. Yeah, yeah. Um, I so I took a, a job position, which was about programming, uh, and I actually happened to like it a lot. Then, <laughs> what I had seen during my studies were more formal mathematical stuff, and I was not so much into that when it came to pro pure programming and then when I started doing actual programming and discovering that it's more uh, a little bit like solving small puzzles every day uh, that's yeah. what I liked in the end. Yeah I think a lot of us come to it with a kind of kids who solved puzzle books yeah. Right, mindset yeah that uh, is where it gets lots of fun. I can see now seeds of where what you're going to tell us about today comes in if you've got a background in networking and kernels and infrastructure things. Yeah. But so you currently work at a company called Symphony, right? Correct. And they are something in technology for finance. Tell us about that. Yes. So we are a collaboration platform for the financial services industry. Uh, so what we build is 
a chat platform but that has well real-time communication and collaboration capabilities uh, but that we want to make sure we can build workflows on top of uh, we are just not we're not just here to help people chat as they would do uh, with other chat platforms but we want to make sure that uh, we can help them solve their daily problems and their daily problems are most of the time related to workflows so how can we streamline the efficiency of those workflows how can we bring automation into those workflows through bots or other types of integration that's really what we try to do give me an example so someone so someone presumably on a trading floor at a bank um so there are there can be many ways that we can do it uh, one example i can take is for instance more in the post-trade scenario so okay you have two traders, they agree on a price, they were on the phone call, they say, yeah, I want to buy this amount of, uh, of this stock, for instance, uh, at this price. Uh, then comes the time where you have these instructions are given to the teams that will actually carry out the trade. Uh, there was a formal agreement that is going to happen. Now it needs to happen. There needs to be assets exchanged. There needs to be verifications about uh, the quantity, the price, and so on. And so uh, that's when you can start filling expenses where... Uh, there are, can be exceptions or breaks in the execution of the trades. And you have different people uh, that may be from the same company as the trader or not, because they, you may have other parties that get involved to actually execute the trade. That may happen in a different region where the, the trader is located on a different stock exchange and so on. And so you, you need to make sure that you can both convey the context of that conversation while also uh, connecting the people that may not know each other, may not have the full context, so that in the end they are able to provide a satisfactory answer quickly to this problem. Okay. Yeah, I can see why that would be something where you want interactive chat that was fast, but also Slack isn't going to quite cut it for something like that. Well, he you need more something that's a bit more specialized for the financial industry mm. to do that. And you need to have, start thinking of modelizing what's a trade operation, how you can convey that context. I hope you can make sure that this is also potentially very sensitive information that you have in the trade. And that's not necessarily public knowledge. So you need to have uh, strong guarantees in terms of security and encryption of the data. Yep. Uh, this data should not be shared with us even, for instance. That's why we set up end-to-end -end encryption. Okay. Uh, and also you need to have compliance on top of it because any trade operation that's happening may be subject for inst investigations later on. So you need to make sure that you have archiving of those conversations uh, and so on. And a lot of checks about who is actually able to talk with anyone. Okay. Like that. I also see hints of that of why you want an immutable log of everything that happened. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I may be getting ahead of myself. Because <laughs> it's it's, in internet years, it's a fairly old company, right? It's about eight years old. Yeah, it's about eight years old. It was founded in 2014. Uh, at its inception, it was formed as, through uh, a conglomerate of uh, banks, actors from the financial industries, uh, that got together, recognized that they had a need for which there was no solution in the market for them at this point in time. Right. And that's how they, they started Symphony. Okay. That that already seems like something of a miracle. My experience of banks is they can barely agree with themselves someday. Yeah, I, I guess there were some doubts at the beginning whether it was going to be successful or not. But, well, we're here. Uh, we have managed to grow outside of this core group of banks that founded Symphony. We now have uh, uh, more than 1,000 customers worldwide. And uh, wow. we have about 500,000 users, uh, a bit more than 500,000 users uh, in oh, our wow. platform. This is... This is some very serious scale then, in terms of users. Cool. Okay, so um, this is, I know you have a transformation story for me. So what was the original version of the software like when you got there? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we it was formed by a conglomerate of bank. One of the bank did hand out a piece of software that they had built internally to do the communications for them. Okay. Uh, that we inherited. So it means that the software we started operating on is even older than 2014, probably 2010 or 2012. I don't know exactly. Okay. Uh, and, uh, well, because we are, we were a startup at the point in time, though I think we're more in the scale up stage, but uh, still uh, the main focus was how can we. Uh, get return of our investment over this asset? How can we make sure that we can uh, deploy it to more and more customers? And so the, this thing that was built to be single tenant, so meant to be used by a single company, uh, we took it, we 
enhanced it, added more capabilities, but we also kept this model of having a single tenant architecture where we are deploying dedicated instances for each of our customers, which also fits nicely with their concerns around security and, uh, and compliance. And well, we reached a point in time where we have 500 different instances for those and it starts being hard to manage, uh, operationally speaking, uh, having yeah. the right level of service uh, to all of those customers. And knowing that we have customers of varying sizes, we have very big customers, uh, which will bring tens of thousands of users on the platform, and we'll have smaller ones that will bring 50, 100 uh, users on the platform. And they don't necessarily have the same needs when it comes to operations, to scale, and so on. And, and so, well, the model that was coming from a big bank, so was more tailored for our tier one customers, proved to be costly for our tier two or tier three customers. So that's when we start thinking about how can we do things in a multi-tenant way and how can we break this component that we had, which was a monolith in the end that was doing multiple uh, uh, functions at the same time. How can we break it down into microservices so that we can better manage those services, better adapt uh, what we need to adapt when it comes to scales, resiliency or patterns of usage. Um, based on the need and based on the actual load for this function that is handled by the microservice. Right. I, I can see the motivation to start refactoring that, but where do you even begin? I mean, that's nebulous. Yes, that's nebulous. And that's one of the reasons where uh, there were several tries and errors and and not everything went smoothly. Uh, so well, the first thing was to try to say, well, can we do multi-tenancy from a pure uh, infrastructure level? So is, are there some things that we can co-host or not? Uh, can we co-host, for instance, to data stores only while keeping the compute more in a single tenant fashion? Uh, there were different groups that were brought in. This project was well, has been going on for something like four years now. And so there were, as you can assume, different iterations. Uh, we didn't get the outcomes that we were expecting and the timelines that we were expecting. So it's been going on. Uh, there were intents to start building everything as microservice. And then, well, people realized that, well, we can't stop delivering function. You can't and shut so down there, development while you refactor yeah, the whole thing, right? Yeah, definitely. And so that's where there were... I would say different ways to try to go through this. And, and now we think that we have a good handle on as to how we are going to complete all of that, uh, hopefully before, uh, before next year. So what, what was your approach that's finally starting to work? So one of the things that uh, we came to realize is to build microservices, you also need to start understanding um, what are the level of isolation in which you want to put your microservices, right? You don't want to end up having a distributed monolith where everything is coupled and you cannot do independent releases of your microservices. You cannot uh, easily limit the impact when there is an incident happening on a service and, and all of those things. Yeah, yeah. The classic, if you've got, if every microservice depends on several others entirely and one can bring the whole thing crashing down, it isn't yes. really a microservices architecture. It's, it definitely is not. And you yeah. get the wrong, uh, the worst things coming from the monolith and the worst things coming from the microservices <laughs> and, and you're just worst off overall. So we do want to make sure that we have proper isolation of our microservices. And so we also want to define what are the interfaces for our microservices. How do they communicate with one another and exchange data? And that's where we came to think, well, doing everything synchronously is probably not the best way to do it. Even though you can use a service mesh, uh, there's, there's still significant complexity to building it like that. And that's where we thought, well, we need to focus on asynchronous communications. And most of the data that is being exchanged is actually exchanged in an asynchronous way. So that should be fine. Uh, and so we really want to start thinking about how we do event streaming, how we core choreograph all those microservices together. How do we start building, documenting the event streams that we have built? Uh, what is the data that's available within them? How do we start think, integrating governance there as well so that we can ensure that uh, we have we are creating services that are going to be reusable and we are creating data sets and even streams that are going to be reusable by other parties and all of these things. So how much of the like, foundational thinking was, how, was kind of event analysis? How much of it was data modeling before you got really stuck in? 
Um, I think uh, in the original phase, we were thinking, well, we know we have these big categories of functions, and so we'll just start creating microservices for them. Then at some point, we started realizing that, well, to be able to model, for instance, the... so. As I said, we're a chat platform, so we have uh, streams of uh, messages that represent conversations, and we need to make sure that we can archive all of those. Uh, if you just say, well, we have a, a retention, which we uh, for every message that comes in, we'll make sure that they are in the table, and we have a service that basically reads the content of this table as an after the fact to be able to start uh, archiving those, those data in a different format somewhere in a file. Uh, we are failing at uh, understanding what is the core uh, of what we are trying to do, which is building the archive. We are not here to build the, the service. We are not really here to build the, the retention itself. We are just here to make sure that we have the right pipeline that go into uh, building the archive. And having this level of understanding, so it's just not event analysis. It's a bit more, uh, I would say, high-level understanding of what are the product domains, what are the value they add, and from there on, uh, what are their areas of responsibility? And once we started doing that, then that's when I think we started realizing that the events were a way for us to convey the information between the different domains. Um, but they were not the... well. And, and that's then afterwards when we start thinking, well, how do we improve our interfaces so that we capture the right level of events? And we start entering really into the event analysis, per se. Okay, so it was more driven by the the value you think you can get from a particular architecture and then you got into the event modeling analysis yes yes yeah, okay that makes sense so so you say that building the archive was a core concern well it's one of the concerns it, i i think it's just one example uh, where we can make that properly illustrates that there is a dichotomy between the uh, the operations, making sure that you can have a chat that is responsive and so on, and the, uh, a secondary function, which is we can make sure that we can build the archive. Okay. Uh, now we have other types of use cases, uh, and the one I'm describing, it's also one of the most complex that we are handling, so it's not the first one that we tackle. Uh, and well, there is also, because we are in a transformation phase, uh, we also need to make sure that we demonstrate that what we want to achieve is doable, that it allows us to cover for different patterns of integrations and patterns of uh, usage of event-driven architecture. Uh, and so we started more with those simpler use cases where we can show, okay, we are going to use Kafka for doing this? Why do we use Kafka? Do we have the right provider for it? Do we get what we want in terms of operations and the automation that we want out of it? Okay. And then we build on top of it and say, well, it, now we are not doing, we start with simple publish, subscribe uh, model, then we go, okay, maybe we'll have a CQRS type of integration and we show that we can do it and that it works fine. And then we start going more and more into, well, we want to integrate multiple services. So we start defining uh, the governance for the event schemas. And on top of that, we'll come and we we'll say, well, now we have enough foundations that we know we can handle this compliance archiving use case and we'll start working into it. Okay, make that a bit more concrete for me. What, what was the actual first thing you built? Yeah, the very first thing we built uh, was uh, something to create webhooks on top of the platform. So as I said, we want to make sure that you can have more data flowing into your chats. Uh, and one of the use cases we had from our customers is, well, we have systems, I don't know, you can think of GitHub or Chira or whatever. Uh, they have the ability to identify that there are events happening on their side and call an endpoint to say, well, this thing happened. Uh, and, and then we wanted to make sure that we can map what we would receive on this endpoint and define a form of abstraction to say you can, uh, our customers can uh, configure endpoints so that uh, whatever happens in those systems will be transformed into a message into a specific chat room. Okay. okay. So to do that, we were in the stage where, well, we have to expose a webhook uh, API uh, and we want to decorrelate the actual ingestion into the right chat room from just receiving the, the calls from the third party systems that are calling the API so that we can make sure that we uh, accept the messages as fast as we can uh, and we take care of the, all the work that's related to ingesting, identifying the right chat room, doing the encryption that we may have to do and things like that asynchronously. 
Okay, that makes a lot of sense to me because it's one of those. Cause the thing I was struggling to understand is how do you refactor a chat thing when chat is the absolute heart of it, right? But yeah, so third, getting third party data hooked into the system that seems like a manageable chunk that you can chew off all at once. Yes. Right? Yeah. Definitely. How did it go? Well, it went very fine. Uh, given, well, we also knew that we were not taking a high risk doing that. So uh, it was fairly well bounded problem uh, with uh, well, a simple interface when it came to doing uh, uh, events there because we are just decoupling. It's the same service that in the end exposes the API and then will do the ingestion of the message. So that's same service that's talking to itself. Um, there aren't too many problems to just put in, in the middle a Kafka topic just to decorate the pure API response from the actual processing of the messages. And did you hook, so you put that data into Kafka, did you hook Kafka into your existing monolith or start feeding the monolith into Kafka? So we didn't do that. Uh, what we did is uh, there is the monolith still exposes the REST APIs. So we are going through the REST APIs to effectively push the, the data into the monolith for the time being. As we're in the middle of having this single tenant to multi-tenant transformation, uh, it's one of the things where, well, given we're using Confident and Confident Cloud in particular, and we have lots of instances, uh, we didn't want to go to hitting limitations about number of connections to the Kafka cluster, having to handle hundreds of potential service accounts to model each of those different groups of instances. So we, we, we were keeping this integration with the monolith when will be fully multi-tenant for our, uh, for this monolith, or uh, what we are considering doing now, uh, which maybe happened earlier, is build um, uh, an adapter. Uh, the monolith already has some events that it uh, exposes uh, that are going to uh, uh, SNS SQS today on uh, when we're on AWS or GCP pops up when we are on GCP. And what we are planning to do, uh, because the topics where they are publishing are single tenant as well, what we're planning to do is build an adapter that would consume all those single tenant data, aggregate them, and then publish them into a, a multi-tenant Kafka topic afterwards. Okay. So you're gradually moving the data over that way. So that, yeah, we can get the data out of the monolith that way. And then to push the data into the monolith, well, then that's still something we haven't fully figured out. <laughs> Are you hoping to? You are hoping to gradually yes. pull away from. Okay. Yeah. So there will be two two way operation for a while. Yeah. Uh, what we are intending to do is well understanding also what are the pieces that we can take out of the monolith, and when we take them out at this point in time, we say, well, we will use Kafka uh, to do the intercommunication with other components that may already be pulled out of the monolith, uh, and that's how we are moving uh, as we go step by step. How long has that been going on for, that transformation? So purely event streaming. So we started thinking about it, designing it uh, by the last quarter of 2020. Uh, so we came up with the actual, what it is that we want to do beginning of 2021. Uh, we handled, uh, so three first use cases during uh, Q1 and Q2 of 2021. Uh, out of the three use cases, so two went uh, up to production. So this universal webhook, another one that's a little bit similar for integration with third-party partner systems, but that have dedicated APIs to, to flow into our system. And the third one did not go to production for other business reasons, no, nothing related to Kafka. Okay. And uh, so from the end of uh, 2021 up to now, what we are doing is more finding those new use cases where we can uh, add uh, the usage of Kafka. So that's more opportunistic. Uh, and we also starting to, um, so part of those use cases, there is, for instance, the business intelligence. Currently, for everything that's related to data analytics in Symfony, we do have separate pipelines and a dedicated team with their dedicated platform to do everything that's related to uh, the actual hard work on the data and then feeding into a visualization tool. So we are now also starting to say, well, anything new that you need to feed into this uh, BI complex, uh, we, we are modeling so that it go through Kafka. And, and that's one of the things where we are hoping that we'll start building our catalog of events so that whatever we feed into the BI through this channel will be reusable also by uh, other components if there needs to be. 
you're already capturing that information in one place and you're wondering if it would be useful in multiple other places. Right? Yes. That sort of relates to, because your, your job is technical architect, right? Yes. So how, how do you go to the BI team and say, I've got this new idea of how we should do architecture and I want you to follow along with me? So actually, um, I had some discussions with the BI team for some time, and we know that there are pain points today with their architectures because to ingest the data, they have something like seven or eight different pipelines, which have different technologies, which uh, require their own operation model and so on. And we know it's a pain for them today. right? And so uh, what we go to them is to say, well, we understand you have a pain and you have problems and we have a solution to help you fix it. And we also understand that, well, you have uh, uh, concrete deliverables and concrete production use cases today that you cannot break. So we are not going to come to you and say, you're going to replace everything. We're going to come to you and say, well, we have this new thing that you know you're going to have to do. So we propose to you that we follow this new approach that we have. We discuss it together. Uh, we agree on what are the principles, what are the benefits for you that you're going to get. Uh, and we validate that it works with this use case. And if you think that's fine and you want to go further, then we'll have these other use cases that we have already started conceptualizing that we can add to your roadmap, integrate in, and and we build collaboratively in the end uh, how we go there. There must be a certain amount of trust if they've got seven pipelines and you need to add an eighth temporarily, right? Well, the point is we are showing them that this pipeline we're adding uh, is able to replace all of their seven pipelines. And that's in the end what they are interested in. So we are keeping them a way forward to project into saying, well, this is the one we're going to consolidate upon and we are going to be able to migrate from the others progressively. Okay. So it's a convincing way out of the pain. Yeah, it's two things. It's, well, first showing that we know what we are doing and being able to help them, giving them tooling, uh, is the conversations with the other teams as well. It's not only about uh, tools, it's also about people in the end. Uh, and yeah, and it's being able to, to give them a way to project. Yeah, yeah. Th this, you raise an interesting point. Like, it's not about tools, not just about tools, it's about people, which I always think architects must encounter a lot more or fail right what's what's been your experience dealing with other teams dealing with the team you're working closest to implementing it with management i mean you, you, you from the blue sky thinking to the actual implementation is a long journey how do you interact with all those different teams to get it to work so that's where uh, what i try to do is to show up all through the uh, all through their life cycle to get from idea to production so it's at the very beginning when there is a new idea a new concept be there uh, to help them design it and the thing is we're here to help we're not here to tell them you must do this absolutely so we are here to help them define what are the objectives of what they want to build uh, identify what are the properties that are necessary to meet those objectives discuss with them uh, we'll have different ways of working depending on the team. Personally, I try to adapt to the teams and their level of maturity. If there is a team where there is a tech lead that is that has a lot of experience in building systems, knows very well their stuff, I'll say, well, you do the design. Uh, I'm here to ask questions if you need anything, if you need any help, if you need uh, some insight about this tech that you have never used before, uh, well, you can come to me and we'll work on it together. Uh, what we do want to make sure is that we understand what it is that we want to achieve. Uh, we'll make trade-offs and I'll ask that person to make trade-off and I will make trade-off as well so that we can meet uh, and have uh, a consensus of, of what we can do. There are other use cases with other teams where they have less maturity and where they, the engineering manager will ask, well, Jeff, can you do the design? And yes, I'll do it and then I'll hand it over to the team. I'll do probably a POC. Uh, I'll do some concrete code that I can show them uh, how this will work. Uh, and that's usually what, well, and then it's a balance uh, depending on the, on the maturity and what the the team needs in the end. Yeah, yeah. You make it sound like a large part of the job is clarifying the problem. Oh yeah, definitely. But I guess that's true for any development though. No? Yeah. Well, that's true. I, I would think to say, uh, and, and that's one of the things whether it's architecture or development or anything, the first thing is, well, do I understand properly the problem? 
to understand probably the solution that I want to bring to the problem. Uh, and once this is done, I feel that the code part is the easy part because you, you don't have too many questions left. <laughs> and you yeah, always know what you want to Stack do. Overflow, right? <laughs> yeah, anyway, you can just <laughs> copy paste somewhere. Oh, well, that's what we use open source, you know. As most of the problems we're facing have already been faced by someone else. So either there's yeah. Stack Overflow or there is an open source library somewhere that you can make use of. Open source so is the sophisticated version of copy and yeah. paste. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How does that translate into dealing with management? Because that's not quite the same thing, and they must have high expectations of you, right? Well, when it comes to management, uh, I, I don't think it's really different because in the end, well, managements are concerned about the results, right? That's one thing. Mm. Uh, and as long as the results show up, they are just fine. Uh, so, And they can also understand the difference between as an architect I provided some guidelines. Uh, there was some trade-offs. So as long as we have clear documentation and clear explanations for the different phases and why it is that we proposed this original design, what was the reality check that did not pass or did pass, uh, and if there are reality checks, and, and when there are failures, as long as we are continuously refining, integrating the feedback, and making sure that in the end, there would be a successful outcome management is is fine okay okay i can see uh that plus a bit of patience could work out. yeah <laughs> well then it depends on on the culture really uh, i i can see here that in symphony uh, i have very good relationships with the different layers of management whether it's uh, the top management or the the engineering managers uh, they understand what we are trying to do they understand that we are not here to to force them into doing things and that we we are just here to try to get into production with the least amount of cost and burden on them, uh, but also making sure that when they are into production, they won't be loaded with production issues or they won't be facing a customer that's not happy because the system is not doing what they thought they would be doing and things like that. Okay, yeah. So clarity and trade-offs. That's. Let's take that into the future. If if that's your core philosophy of technical architecture, you must have some clarity on where you want to get to and what you think the trade-offs will be. Tell me about yeah. where you're going. So really what we want to adopt is the is data mesh overall for our, our event streaming. Um, so we are currently focusing on building what we call the event mesh, which I would describe as the subset of data mesh that's focused on real-time event streams. Uh, and from there on, we would like to, to bridge the gap to build, to integrate other types of data sets, other types of technologies, so that we can be more agile in the way we handle uh, the data inside the company. When you say event mesh, let me just pause you there. Did, yeah. Would you include in that the notion of publishing data as a kind of data as a product? Yes, definitely. Uh, that's really where we want to go. So. When we started this journey on event streaming, we we set ourselves some principles, uh, and out of those principles, there was the fact that we wanted to well isolate the product domains, uh, making sure that we can reach eventual consistency through the event streaming, making sure that we have clear contracts uh, onto the event streams uh, for both the producers and the consumers. And the last one, which is a bit longer term for us, is making sure that we can uh, handle uh, multi-region and global uh, sharing of the of the data. So, uh, and when we are going there, actually, uh, I think the first and the third thing that I mentioned are core pieces of data mesh. So we came into the realization that what we wanted to do was actually data mesh uh, a bit later on. Uh, and from there on, well, we, we tried to understand really what was meant by this concept, uh, double-checked all the uh, the good documentation coming from uh, Shamak Degani on this, uh, starting getting more knowledge about other types of tools that are used in the context of data mesh, uh, and trying to really build that thing so that we can uh, go there fully afterwards. But it's, for me, it's really more generalization of what were considered before good practices in event-driven uh, architectures uh, and that we are just generalizing by making sure that, uh, well, 
the events that you are building, the data that you are sharing is actually a product. So you want to have good quality on it. You want to make sure that it's easily accessible, that it's documented, discoverable, addressable, and, and all of those things. Yeah. And I, that I you can trust it. Yes, absolutely. I sometimes think that the um, the if you start with the core idea that events, facts are worth capturing permanently, and when you do that, you can use them in multiple different ways, you almost inevitably start discovering some of the data mesh ideas because you're going to say, well, this stream of facts is useful in different ways. We need to make that a primary product that we can republish to different people who have different ideas about how to consume it, right? And I think it's it's also very important for uh, the operational standpoint and understanding what are your components that are mission critical, what are the ones that are not, how you make sure that the components that are mission critical have always the data that they need available, that they don't need to depend on a third party system. So you really start going into uh, generalizing the concept of the uh, domain driven uh, design, which were more focused on the analysis of the data that you have. And you can uh, apply the same thing to your services and you start building those uh, bounded contexts of services, uh, which are independent, which have all the data they need, which uh, have clear interfaces, which you can control and from which you can also uh, ensure that they will not be impacted if there is another context that fails and also that they will not impact another context if they fail, which is very important for mission critical applications. If yeah. you start going to microservices and having lots of services that you need to manage. Yeah, yeah, that kind of segregation is, is exactly the solution we're looking for to that microservices that depend on each other problem that is just a distributed monolith, right? Yeah. Yeah. So um, you, you say you're kind of gradually coming along to the data mesh way of thinking, but I know, I think I read somewhere in one of your blogs, perhaps, that you're doing something like uh, the governance piece in that you're keeping a lot of contextual information in event headers. Yeah. Have I got that right? And if I have, tell me more about it. Yeah, so there are two things that we started doing. One is building an event catalog. Um, so we are so we are using Git to be able to do that. Uh, okay. And we are applying the same practices as we would apply to our APIs or our code to our event models. So we have this Git repository where we push, uh, where we document all our events. So not only the schemas for the events, but also having additional information like in which topics is this event going to be available? Uh, who are the producers? Who are the consumers that we know? Uh, what is the the format? Uh, are we using protobuf, JSON, uh, this kind of thing? Mm -hmm. We'll apply uh, a pull request process on top of it so that we can get the producers and the consumers to agree on the contract that is represented by the schema. Uh, and then we'll start applying governance on top of it to do things like uh, well, providing standardized name for common attributes, uh, implementing uh, linting, uh, backward compatibility checks through the CI processes, uh, having the PRs with not only the uh, the participants, producers, and consumer teams, but also the architect that can provide their guidance as to how things are moving. Um, and in the end, we also want to set up continuous deployment pipelines so that we can take those models that we have and push them into a schema registry so that we are sure that whatever we have in the live system matches what we have documented. Okay. So you're kind of using Git as a schema registry with pull requests and CI. Well, the thing is with schema registries, at least what we saw today is that they are very bound to an environment and making sure that what you have in a given environment matches what flows into the topics. However, the events that we're publishing, well, they're published by code. And so they, they will follow a similar life cycle as what you have with your code in the mm -hmm. sense that they will evolve. Uh, they need to be created at some point in time. They will evolve. Sometimes there will be changes uh, that are breaking in your interface. And so you need to think about having new versions and so on. And, and because we have that, it felt natural to us to say, well, we're going to replicate what we have for our code. So to say, there are some events that are pushed into the schema registry of the development environment that represents what is known there. And when the software that produces those events moves to the qualification stage, then we'll also push the, the schemas then. And when we reach production, we'll push the schemas to production. For us, it felt natural that the events that are published by software follow the same lifecycle of the software. 
Yeah, that makes sense. I wonder if that would be... How many languages do you use? I wonder if that's connected. Uh, we are using, I would say, three languages. So we mostly do Java. Uh, we have some JavaScript a bit. So on the backend side, there are a few components that are written with Node.js. And we have a bit of Clojure as well. Oh, Clojure. Yeah. Oh, that's a favorite of mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, do we you must... make some people from the company happy? Yeah. <laughs> It's it's a it's a lovely language for the JVM if you're thinking in terms of immutable data structures, but we mustn't go down the closure rabbit hole because I could do a whole podcast on that. Uh, maybe we will one day. Okay, so I, yeah, so I was wondering if if the number of programming languages would affect how much benefit you get from centralizing your schemas in um, in Git. Well, the thing that we also try to do is to generate the code so that it's easy to use the schemas. Uh, and we also, by that way, making sure that the, the different teams are not somehow rewriting the schemas before they actually use them. Uh, and well, we can do the code generation in any language that we want to know the, the tools that mm. are available, although to do it in JavaScript, uh, Java, or I don't know if we want to do tomorrow for mobile applications in Swift or something else, we can do it as well. Mm. Uh, the risk of sidetracking. Are there any plans to turn to use that to generate TypeScript? Any any moves towards TypeScript in the company? Uh, so we use TypeScript for the front ends, but not for the back ends, as far as I know. Right. So oh, curious. Okay. So so yeah. So that's the first thing that we do. The second thing, specifically for the headers, is that we do have a subset of common properties uh, that we convey through headers and. Thought are the things that can either be used to filter the data. Maybe not all consumers are interested in all the events. So we do put some uh, some pre-information inside the header so that they can easily discard if they are not interested in. And anything that's, re that's necessary to be able to read the events. So information about the, well, the type of the event, uh, the tenant, uh, the encoding that is used, uh, is it protobuf or, or not? Uh, did we use uh, base64 representation or did we represent in JSON? All of the things. Uh, also, if we do put encryption uh, for some data that may be uh, uh, sensitive, we are likely to put encryption. So we'd have the encryption key ID, for instance, so that the consumer uh, uh, can easily know which key to use to be able to decrypt the data. OK. Okay, so yeah, that that makes perfect sense for kind of header header based information. Okay, so where do you think? Let's see if we can like summarize this. Where do you think where the company will be on this project twelve months from now? So I think twelve months from now we'll have um, broader adoption of the event match in the sense that we'll have had enough event streams created that it's become a more natural way of thinking for the developers. So I will not say it would be yet their default way of thinking, but something uh, most of our developers will have been exposed with and will we'll know how to use. Uh, I assume that we'll start having also a bigger share of our data that is actually flowing into the event mesh and being uh, documented there. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, yeah, I expect that probably 70 to 80 percent of our data would be would be in there by this point in time oh wow would that Going, include the core chat information do you think by then yes yes i think we will do it uh, and one of the reasons is uh the archiving use case that i mentioned earlier uh, it's one of those use cases where we have more and more challenges into uh, so currently the way it's done is that we have a standalone batch that queries the monolith to retrieve all the data that was ingested between two points in time, it then tries to serialize that into a file. Uh, that requires a lot of processing power. It requires to be done, uh, well, off peak hours it requires, and we have more and more requirements about having multiple different schedules for different business units in the in our customers, uh, different formats because different business units will use different providers for the archiving and stuff like that. And that's something that's not going to scale very well. And, and we know it. And so that's one of the things where we know where we'd get a lot of benefits if we go by having this immutable log uh, of data flowing in and that we can build in the cloud more processing for this, uh, doing this asynchronously, preparing the data uh, to go into files so that it 
as it streams, literally. And, and because that use case will also entail the core chat data and many things related to it, uh, I think that's when we will have progress enough. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. It's funny, I think um, if you want to find a good use case for something like Kafka, like an event streaming model, you start by look, asking what business processes have to run batch in the off hours. And really? that, that, that's, that's always where real time ought to be happening and totally isn't. Um, not to put a downer on it, but what do you think the biggest risk is to getting there? Uh, the biggest risk is, well, for me, it's uh, yeah, this transformation journey that I mentioned. We have mm. multiple transformations happening at the same time. So we mentioned single tenant to multi tenant. Yeah. Uh, we mentioned monolith to microservices. We're also switching cloud provider. So there is a lot of technical stuff happening and, and we just need to make sure that we were able to secure the time for the people to also focus on this thing, which which is contrary to the others. The others are more about how we reduce our footprint to better control our cost, where this is more how can we open up ourselves so that we can handle um, more use cases in the future in a more agile way. Uh, so it's just making sure that we have enough focus put on this so that we, we carry it out. But from the technology point of view, the uh, the design, what we want to do, I think we have laid out almost all of the foundational pieces and it's more now just executing. Okay. Well, actually, uh, I hope we have you back in a year to see how you've got on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know you've written a blog post about some of this with more gory technical details, but um, the thing I'm going to walk away with is if you're a, if you're a technical architect, clarity, awareness of problems, and a focus on the people involved, that's what you seem to have in spades. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't say it because I think it goes without saying that, but you need to know what you are doing, technically speaking, as well. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> cool. Well, on that, I think we'll leave it. Thank you very much for joining us, Jean-Francois. That's uh, it's an interesting business case. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure to discuss all of this with you. And I hope, well, it will spring some conversations. And uh, if anyone wants to reach out, feel free. You'll know where to, to cool. find we'll me. We'll put your contact details in the show notes. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye. Well, we'll have to get Jean-Francois back in a year to see how that story ends. Um, hopefully it doesn't end. Hopefully it just keeps on growing, right? In the meantime, though, check the show notes for... Uh, there's a good Symphony blog post that goes into some technical details, and we'll link to that. And if you want to get in touch with Jean-Francois or with me, the show notes are also the place to look for our contact information. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. While you're there, now is an excellent time to send us some feedback. So if you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a thumbs up or a rating or a review or whatever feedback your podcasting app offers you. Again, we'd love to hear from you. For more general information on Kafka and event systems, head to developer.confluence.io where you'll find everything from getting started guides to architectural patterns that help you build a successful event system. And somewhere along that journey, you're going to want to spin up a Kafka cluster. So head to confluent.cloud, which is our fully managed Kafka service. Sign up, add the promo code podcast100 to your account, and you'll get $100 of extra free credit to use. And with that, it just remains for me to thank Jean-Francois Garay for joining us and you for listening. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins, and I'll catch you next time. <laughs>